I heard Tony Campolo saying something this morning. He says, uh, you want to hear a sermon, there's plenty of sermons on the radio. On TV, DVDs, CBDs, RFGs, SML. You can get a sermon anywhere. If you want music, there's lots of music. Hallelujah. Yes. But one thing you cannot get on the radio, you can't get a hug. Amen. You can't right. sense the presence of God when you come together in union with a bunch of other brothers and sisters in Christ. Right. You can't get that. You can't get encouraged. You can't be rebuked. I know lots of people who listen to lots of TV and watch it and watch it and watch it. And they go down and down and down and down until they can barely stand up. They have no faith at all. What have they been listening to on TV? Faith. Believe God. Seek God. Everything's, you know, and they hear the sermons of the greatest preachers on earth. Right. But they have no life in them because there's no life this way. That's right. Mm -hmm. Come on. The breaking of bread, the apostles' teaching, and prayer. These are the foundations of the church. The breaking of bread is fellowship. The breaking of bread is when we come together and we rub on each other till our Amen. parts that aren't nice rub off Amen. and we fit together in the body of Christ. Yes. Amen. That's right. Because if yes. we're not fitting into the body of Christ, then we're not fitting into the body of Christ. Yes. Right. If all you got is TV, I feel sorry for you. Yeah. On TV, you guys. <laughs> if that's all you have, get yourself to church. It's like... It's like the guy who said, I drink wine because there's good stuff in it. The guy who wrote that down was a producer of wine. Mm -hmm. There's good <laughs> stuff in wine. You, you, if you drink it every day, there's good stuff in it. I want you to know that there's... Go eat the grape. <laughs> yes. I mean, everything that the red wine gives you up front will destroy you with the alcohol anyway. So go eat the grape. The stuff you get from the grapes that is good is from the skin of the grape. Or even the seed of the grape. So go eat the grape. Hallelujah. I like really good wine. Though. I like grape juice too. I like all kinds of stuff. I, I really love God and how his creation and how his creativity gets. It just overwhelms me. In fact, I'm going to go into it a little bit today. The creativity of God, the artistry of God. I read a book this week. He, God is, he was asking God about flowers. The flowers of the field, and neither sow nor eat. Nor, I tell you, in Solomon and all his glory, is not arrayed one such as these. Now, what is the deep truth? God asked him, why do you think I made flowers? Eh, he said, they're pretty. Yeah. And he's waiting for the rest of the revelation. <laughs> What, is there any more? They're pretty. God made flowers because they're pretty. There's different reasons for flowers, but God made them because they're pretty. I want you to know that there is a, a frog, fishy looking thing in Death Valley that stays under the dirt for years until it rains. He'll come squirreling out of the dirt. He'll flop around in the mud for a while. He'll breed and then go back into the dirt. Why would God do that? Because it's cool. <laughs> that is cool, man. Why would God? Because it's cool. There's no purpose for them things. Stir up the mud. <coughs> mud things. <laughs> and we got to see them. I thought they were cool too, God. That's about the only reason. There are so many things on the face of this, this earth. That's the only reason. Because they're cool. And God likes them. I was... I was I told you the story before. I was on the hill back over here by, by Chris's house. One time, standing on the hill, it was snowing outside, and I was walking up the hill, and all of a sudden, the moon was out, and I didn't see it until it broke through the clouds like this, and the snow was filtering down through the, and it was sparkling with the moonlight. I am going, wow. Yeah. I was just standing there, you know, it was snowing, and I, and I thought, I thought in my head, I thought, how many other people are looking at this? He says, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me just like that. He says, do you see anybody else standing here? Yeah. <laughs> it was only right there. Nobody else seen it. Nobody else around. There weren't even any cars on the road because it was snowy. 
I was the only one. God made it for me. Amen. For me. Hallelujah. Yeah. The glory of God, just the artistry of God, the, the magnificence of God. It just, it just was yeah. flabbergasted. Amazing. Hallelujah. Yeah. It is amazing. Yeah. And I'm going to go to that a little later too. But I'm going to go here first. Not ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, let me start out in Luke 9. Luke 9. I started a series on the difference between poverty, riches, and wealth. And I haven't finished that yet because I didn't understand all I knew about it. So I waited a week or two. Okay? But I'm going to come back to that even more next week. Because Regina asked me that day, she says, uh, you never did finish that series. I said, <laughs> I was going to say, what, what series? <laughs> <laughs> But you can't lie or pull the wool over. <laughs> it just it is impossible sometimes. So. <laughs> now you re you guys really realize that you are blessed, correct? Yes. yes. Because we've been taught by God our Father how blessed we are. Yes. We live in a country that's blessed far beyond any on earth. Yes. Now I want you to know this LGBTQ thing. A couple of years ago, they did a study, and they, there was 4% homosexuals in the United States. 4%. Given the few years since, we might give them 10. I want you to know the United States is filled up with mostly people who believe in God. That's right. Don't you get the lie down in your head somewhere. They're taking me. The only way, in fact, I'm going to read it. That's the one California. <laughs> All that is necessary for the forces of evil to win is for enough good men to do nothing. That's right. So far, the only reason that darkness has been perpetrated in this country is enough good men have done nothing. And I want you to know that there is enough good men in Reno that are raising up and beginning to do great things. They stood up, they've become a majority, they become a voice, and they're not putting up, the, and the one guy said, not on my watch. Yeah. Evil will not triumph on my watch. And here we are Christians, we're in Fernley, okay. So we, of ourselves, can also do the same thing. Yeah. Get busy, in other words. So I just wanted you to know, it's not hopeless, it's not 50-50, you all. It's not, it's not 50-50. It's 90-10, major. Right. Okay? So I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Uh, how many people you talk to lately about the Lord have really put you down? Not very many. And there's two reasons for that, of course. One reason is that it says that anyone who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, it may be that you're not uh, uh, living godly, therefore you're suffering no persecution. That's what I always think. I get, go to the negative right away, right? Yeah. But the other reason is maybe that there's so many believers and so many people that are right on the edge of wanting to come into the body of Christ that they just want to hear the truth of the gospel. They're not enemies of the cross. They are right on the edge. Of, they want. They are seekers. Just like we were when we came into the kingdom. Yes. We're seeking something. We're seeking God. We wanted, we wanted release from our old habits. We wanted release from the burden of sin. We wanted the release from the guilt and the shame of what we'd done in the past. And we came to Christ and got cleansed and filled up with the Holy Spirit. I came to God because I wanted my life to be better. That's what I came in for. That's what I came in for. I didn't come even really to have my sins forgiven. I was pretty guilty, but... <laughs> I didn't feel like it. But I didn't feel like I just wanted my life because I was a transcendental meditator at the time. Yeah. My life was becoming more God-conscious all the time. I want you to know that I was growing spiritually. <laughs> like this. <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Now, does transcendental meditation work? Yes. I want you to know these other things, that they're, they're spiritual things. You know the puja? They say, you've got to kneel down there at the altar, you bring up an orange and a napkin and I forget something else. And you bow down there and you do this thing and they're talking the name. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I read a translation for it. That was paraphrased. I read a translation of the puja and what they're saying. To this God, I bow down. To this man, I bow down. To this master, I bow down. To this other God, I bow down. I'm sorry I don't bow down to those guys. 
when I realized that, and then I went to John 14, 6, and it says, Jesus says, written and ready, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Amen. So I knew, they told me Jesus was a transcendental meditator. <coughs> they told me that. The first time God ever meant more than a word to me after I was grown up is in a transcendental meditation meeting and I was sitting there meditating this guy says, I don't know what you've heard about transcendental meditation, but we feature God here. And that word God woke something up inside of me and I thought, God, yes. cool. God, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see God. I got all excited. I could, and, and pretty soon I realized my sister was praying for me. Praise the Lord. Teresa, she was here last week. Yeah. Pray me in, glory to God. So, in uh, now that we know that we're blessed, so what rabbit trail was that? Okay. <laughs> now that we know that we're blessed, it says in Luke 9, 62. It says in 9.62, it says, Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Just because you're blessed, I wrote down here, don't stop now that you are blessed. We need to, at this time, seek God, expect more, not produce more, but believe God for more, than we've ever had before. Yes. We need to press in and not only get blessed, but get blessed. Right. And then blessed. Because this is not a stagnant thing. This, uh, this kingdom of God is just ongoing all the time. Yes, and we're yes. blessed one after another. In fact, not only are you blessed, but you have an opportunity to bless your children, yes. your children's children, and your children's children's That's children. Right. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. That's why we keep going. That's why we continue. We don't stop because we get blessed. I'm, I'm comfortable. We get in our comfort zones. Yeah. We get them comfort zones, man. I'm making plenty of dough. I'm okay. Everything's fine. I'm pretty healthy. You know, I, you know, what more could I want? I have, I have an abundance. I think I'm going to build bigger barns and put my stuff in bigger barns and you know, I tell, say, say to my soul, take thy ease, O soul. And then it says in the scriptures, you say, it says, uh, you fool, don't you, don't you know this day your soul shall be required of you? What? What? What are you talking about? You wouldn't die today, dude. Where are you going to put your crops in? What barns are you going to fill? Praise the Lord. We don't we don't make more gravy to drown in our gravy. Come on. Yeah. That's right. We make more gravy to spread it on other people's potatoes. That's right. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. That's right. That's right. I'm not talking about spreading it on lazy people's potatoes. I'm not talking about spreading it on, on right. people. Who, no, not unworthy cause. We, we know a, a worthy cause when we see it. If we yeah. don't, we need to learn. In fact, sometimes you give to a cause that's not worthy and you learn. Or you stay bitter for the rest of your life. I know people have stayed bitter the rest of their life because some funky ministry got off track and did the wrong thing. I ain't giving them stinking Christians anymore. They're thieves. Well, you know, that's like saying every carpenter doesn't know how to pound a nail. Because one didn't. I got nail guns now. You don't have to know how to pound a nail. <laughs> Just pull it back and check it out. Okay. Okay, so keep your hand to the plow. Seek God. <coughs> Expect more from God. Yes. Woo! Believe Him for more. The Bible says in six, Matthew 6.33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things shall be added unto you. Doesn't it say that? Yeah. Yes, it says. Hallelujah. It. So if we seek first the kingdom, and we have all these things added to us, what do we get to do with the things added to us? As long as we're seeking the kingdom first. I love Joel Osteen. Every week, he says, keep God first, and he will take you places you've never dreamed. That's right. That's right he preaches a positive message, but he says it every day. He says, keep God first. He says, the main thing I've done in all my life is to keep my heart pure before God. Amen. I'm thinking, no wonder he's blessed. Mm -hmm. Since he's a little kid, he's kept his heart pure before God. God's going to bless him. I don't care. These guys that come against these people that are doing stuff, how many people... Well, those guys have probably never led anybody to Christ. Yeah. Never blessed anybody with a million dollars. You know that I think there's more uh, generous billionaires than there are greedy ones. 
Because the billionaires I've read about, Gates and all those guys, they give billions and billions and billions of dollars away every year. Yeah. Yeah. Even the heathen. Look at that guy, what's his name? Uh, Musk. Elon Musk. He's, he's, he's making rockets to go to Mars. Why? Because he says, I, I just want a future for my grandkids. He's going to put them on Mars. <laughs> well, he sees what we're doing to the, the world and just stripping it. And then, and then, and then he, he's building a, a, a tunnel thing in L.A. underneath the ground that goes 120 miles an hour. You just set your car on it and it zooms on over to your place. Why? Why do you do that? Because he's sitting in traffic in L.A. once. <laughs> I rest my case. You ever been there? That's all it took for him. He just got, we got to get an idea going here. Yeah. Hallelujah. I just thought I'd run that. And he's, he's not a believer. Listen, children of God. Children of God. You have more potential inside of you than anybody else on earth. You are made in the image of God. You have, you have the mind of Christ. You've been redeemed. You have the spirit of God living in you. Who is more creative than that? Who's more creative than that? Nobody. Hallelujah. I'd like to, I, uh, seeing as I'm on this track, I'd like to just do this. Oh, this is great. Um, this is talking about wealth. The lilies do not toil or spin, yet in spite of the fact they don't work, and they don't provide a ton of benefit, God still made them beautiful. In other words, God likes cool stuff. God likes art. He values beauty even if it does not last long or has no other advantage. You ever see a chalk paint on a sidewalk? Yes. I want to cut that sidewalk out and save it. Because yeah. Yeah. some of that stuff is so good. I mean so good, okay? What does this have to do with wealth? Or anything else for that matter? <laughs> it has everything to do with wealth. Let me take you on a short historic journey that highlights the incredible revelation of the nature of God. Listen to this. In the absence of the printing press and with the scarcity of scriptures and the, uh, the literacy of the congregation, it was bestowed on the fathers of the early church to create a culture experience that emulated the nature of God. These church fathers were steeped in the revelation of splendor, majesty, and the glory of the Lord, and they needed a way to communicate it to a congregation that couldn't read or write, and gatherings of sheer... Uh, in their congregation gatherings of sheer nature of his greatness and divinity. Now watch this. Of course, this was all predated videos, movies, and inventions and innovations of the modern world. So from the third century on, the early church began building monasteries and cathedrals that would capture the greatness, splendor, majesty, grandeur, and glory of God. And you thought they did it for themselves. Oh, that's good. Subsequently, majestic stone walls were erected, gracing the skies with transcendent beauty. Stained glass windows traversed across the sanctuary, whispering the gospel story of the majestic rays of light. Polished marble floors glistened in the morning sun, reflecting the king's magnificence. Podiums elevated to mid-heaven facilitated uh, the thunderous voice of the priesthood. And all this was designed as a multi-dimensional learning experience where the parishioners participated in the discovery of the nature and the outrageous artisticness of God. Isn't that cool? Yes. Hallelujah. We get to thinking that, the, well, you know, in, in, in uh, Protestants, we, we get these tiny little buildings with drop ceilings and nothing on the walls and just in keeping, and there's no majesty there. Of course, we can read and write. So we understand the majesty of God way better than they did. Maybe, maybe not. But God is artistic. God is wonderful. <clears throat> Look around. Even, even He loves beauty too, by the way. He does. Because Sarah was said to be beautiful. In fact, the king wanted to marry her when she was 90. Uh, Rachel was beautiful in form and face. Uh, Abigail was a beautiful woman. Tamar was a beautiful woman. On and on it goes. All these beautiful women in the Bible, he says they're beautiful. Why would he mention that? Because God likes beauty. Isn't that the coolest thing? Mm -hmm. God likes beauty. I've seen women who are ugly. 
And I told you this before, we used to call this one girl Cuzzy Ugly. <laughs> Sorry, she wasn't that pretty. But when she got saved, when she got saved, she turned into this gorgeous woman of God. She is beautiful. Every time you see her, you want to go up and say hi to her because she is so gorgeous. Isn't that the coolest thing? Yeah. When the Spirit of God comes into a person, it makes them beautiful from the inside out. And it does change the outside appearance of a person. That's why I'm so beautiful. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, praise the Lord. <laughs> Let's reiterate this just a little bit. In Luke, Luke, I guess it is Luke. In Luke 14, just a couple pages over. It says in the 12th verse, the 12th, 14, 12, yeah. 12, 14, 12. 12, 14. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, well, Matt, hang on, I'll find it, there it is, 14, 14, well, uh, and also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, or your relatives, that is not the one I wanted. Yeah. I wanted the one in John 14. You got it written down here. It says John right there. <laughs> Listen to this. In the ninth verse it says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that your joy, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Woo, hallelujah. God makes a commandment. He says, I want your joy to be full. He says, love each other. That's how joy is made full. Now watch this. Greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friend. That's love. If you are my friends, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. Now listen to this. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And then whatever you ask the father in my name, I'll give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Once we get into fellowship and begin to change, we can ask God anything and he'll do it. Yeah. You notice it has to do with fellowship there. Love one another, love one another, ask. Love one another, I call you friends. Love one another. That's right. The breaking of bread and fellowship, the apostles' teaching, and prayer. If we miss out on those, those are the foundations of the kingdom of God. Uh, Mike Moresi preached a sermon last week or the week before that. He preached a sermon on what do people ask when they come into a church? What are the main things they would ask? How's the worship? The rock and roll? You know, what, how's the worship? How's the children's ministry? You know, they aren't asking because they want to get involved in it. <laughs> they're asking because they want to glean from somebody else's work okay they don't want to get involved in the worship team they just want to come in and have good singing okay what do people ask about they don't ask is the spirit of God there do you sense his presence every time you come do the people love one another do they preach the word Amen. Those are the questions we should ask, eh? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Okay. So, okay, let's go on here. Okay, let's do this. In John 15. I just love this. Praise the Lord. In John 15, it says, in the ninth verse, it says, as my Father loved me, I also loved you, and abide, so abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, 
and you abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that your joy may my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all the things you've, I've heard of my Father, I have made known to you. I did not choo you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain. And these things I command you, go and love one another. And it says down here in the 18th verse, it says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world will love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore... The world doesn't like you. It yeah. hates you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. And <clears throat> Go to 1622. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. I wrote down here. The world hates you. He hated Jesus without a cause. Nobody's going to take your joy. Yeah. Yeah. And then it says in 23 and 24, it says, In that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask my Father, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. He wants us to have joy in our lives. Ask and you shall receive. Anyone who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The world will hate you. Isn't that the coolest thing? Yeah. For a long time, I was walking around trying to preach to people who looked like they didn't want me to preach to them so I could make an enemy. <laughs> Why? Because nobody hated me. Everybody I talked to got saved. It freaked me out. I wasn't making any enemies at all. I preached the gospel to everybody, and everybody kept getting saved. And I realized I dwell in a country that is mostly Christian people who believe in God, or at least have an inkling and a seeking heart. Not very many enemies of God in our city, you all. You realize this. Please realize this. There's not very many enemies of God here. Right. A few. They're just loud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Hallelujah. Because most people in this awesome country still believe in God. Mm -hmm. Smooth seas don't produce skillful sailors. We can sink into this slimy bog of regret over past failures and tell nobody about the kingdom of God. Or we can get an ugly attitude of entitlement and pride and forget the sacrifice that people made to get us where we are blessed right now. Okay? Either of these attitudes will eventually stop us in our endeavor to further the kingdom of God. I said this before, and this is where I started. The only inoculation to these things is an attitude of thanksgiving. The only inoculation against uh, the spirit of entitlement or pride, saying I should have this or give it to me now and hurry up and that ignore endurance. The Bible says you have need of endurance. For after you have done the will of God, you shall inherit the promise. Okay? <coughs> thanksgiving is inspired when we remember where we came out of. Go to Isaiah 51. This will make more sense next week. I hope you come next week. <laughs> I'm just hitting the highlights here. I, I, anyway. I'll come. Okay. Me too. It says in Isaiah 51, he says, Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look on the rock from which you were hewn, and the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and Sarah, who bore you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all of her waste places. He will make her wilderness and Eden, her deserts like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Listen to me, my people, and give ear to me, O my nation. For the law will proceed from me, and I will make my justice rest as the light of the people. My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth. My arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait upon me. And on my arms they will trust. Lift, lift up your eyes to the heavens. And look to the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away with the smoke. 
the earth will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will not be abolished. And it goes on and on and on. There is judgment coming. That is for sure. But his word will endure forever. His salvation will go on forever. So, so when, when, there, when our thanksgiving is inspired by not only where we've come from. Because when I think of where I've come from, I get all excited about God who didn't kill me. Yeah. Really, I survived it. Yeah, I survived it. Praise the Lord. And, and if we remember where we came from and we remember where we're going, praise will bubble us. Like we're praying this morning, yes. it will be an effervescent thing. Yes. When you get to focusing on where you've come from, you go, oh, Lord, you saved me, and where you're going, then this thing starts bubbling up in you, and it's, it's a throne for the king. Because when praise begins to bubble up, he is enthroned on the praises of his people, right? He's enthroned on the praises of his people. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When God is enthroned on the praises of his people, that means his kingdom is here. Yes. He's enthroned. Where he's enthroned, his kingdom is there, right? Mm -hmm. Where he's the king, he's enthroned, his kingdom is there. That's what kingdom means. Uh, the kingship, where, where his will is being done. So as we pr create a place for him to dwell in our praise, all of a sudden he shows up and the kingdom of God begins to move. Yes. So I'd throw that in. Okay. Okay. Turn off my light. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, hey. We don't want to let our inheritance turn into a, a, a thing of, uh, of uh, entitlement. You know, when you get an inheritance, you feel entitled all of a sudden. You get whatever you want. You just got $73 million from your uncle, Tuli. And all of a sudden you're entitled, you know, and you start living high up the hog and things like that. And you forget what the sacrifices it took to get there. And what, what happens to us, we, we, if we don't get what we want right when we want it, we start to pout. <laughs> Not you guys, probably. Maybe, maybe it's just me. Sometimes I pout. In James 5, James 5, I just... Away by the generation. I want what I want, I want it now. I'm not like that. I'm speaking that by faith because I am. You ask Regina when I come home and I've been working, what's the first thing I ask? Dinner. What's for dinner? You got something picked out for dinner? Well, no. What have you been doing all day? I do not ask that. I don't ask that. If I ask her if she's got anything for dinner and she don't have anything, I just go and get something. I don't ask why not. I don't ask those stupid questions. There's got to be something left over inside. There's got to be a cucumber or something like that. So in James 5, 7, it says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth? waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing by the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure you have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, don't swear, either by heaven or by earth, or any other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no be more. Any more of that, fall into judgment. And I was looking at that, and I saw that don't grumble against one another. I've been realizing, in fact, I've got a book here I'm going to read something out of. In James 1, 1, uh, 
In the second to the fourth verse, the second and the third verse, I think it is, second to the fourth, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Amen. God wants us lacking nothing. So, that's mentality of wealth. Let me read you something. I want you to know that in this country, our forefathers paid a price for us to have what we have right now. In fact, a couple of them got this, some of this really cool, okay. Um, no, I ain't gonna read that. Okay, uh, John Quincy Adams, the writer of Webster's Dictionary, oh no, and Daniel Webster best summarized this principle when they declared, men, in a word, must necessarily be controlled either by a power within them or by a power without of them. Either by the word of God or by the strong arm of man. Either by the Bible or by the band. Okay? The found, this, this book is called original intent. These guys realize that a, that a people that don't know God cannot be governed by the principles of God. Government is necessarily supposed to serve people, not control them or punish them. Right on. Okay? But it, it is there to control and punish if the people don't control themselves. Because laws are only here to, to control or punish those who don't have any self-control in them to drive 70 miles an hour past the school. That's why we have 15 mile an hour zones. Okay? Because any any smart guy would know if there's kids there, slow the heck down. The law is there because people are not self-controlled and therefore they have to have signs there to tell them, don't go fast, there's kids present. You don't have to have a sign to do that. We need to get in our heads that these principles came from men who thought about stuff and said, hey, we need to do that because some people don't care about anybody but themselves. So we'll put a sign up. That's why. These things were written down by people who understood things. Listen to this. Um, uh, as Daniel Webster noted, we regarded public institution as a wise and liberal system of policy by which property and life and the peace of a society are secured. We seek to prevent, in some measure, the extension of the penal code by inspiring a salutary and conservative principle of virtue and of knowledge at an early age. We seek to turn the strong current of feeling and opinion, as well as the censors of the law and the denunciations of religion, against moral immorality and crime. In other words, we're teaching our kids to do the right thing so we don't have to punish them. He said right at the first, he says, a wise liberal system of policy and property, okay, prevent the, in measure, the extension of the penal code. How many here know there's a lot of laws? Yeah. A lot of laws. You can get away with almost anything. Why? Because people are undisciplined. In the contemplating a political institution in the United States, I lament that we waste so much time and money in punishing crimes and take so little pains to prevent them. We profess to be Republicans, and yet we neglect the only means of establishing and perpetrating our Republican form of government. That is, the universal education of our youth and the principles of Christianity by means of the Bible. Our forefathers understood that unless you teach the kids the Bible, they aren't going to get it, and they're going to be totally undisciplined. Well, I'm going to let my kid learn it on his own. What kind of idiot would say that? I'm going to let some guy down the road teach my kids about God. Or teach my kids about life. Teach my kids about the principles of family. Teach my kids about everything. I just let my kid go free. He needs to be free. My God, people. Freedom means he's... He... Anyway, you guys aren't stupid, so I don't have to do that. Okay. So... So, I'm going to go one more place, okay? In Exodus 31, 1 through 5. 
<laughs> been a kind of a random. Hey, uh, oh, yeah, man. Where did we get these? Up? Okay. The first person to be filled with the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures was a guy named Bezalel. Okay? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and all manners of workmanship to design artistic works to work in gold and silver and bronze, in the cutting of jewels and the setting and carving wood and the work of all manner of workmanship. And I indeed have appointed with him these other guys to administrate. The reason God filled this guy with the Spirit of God was to be able to build stuff artistically. He was the first guy in the Bible to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Now we see up here the Spirit of the Lord is upon us because he anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. God anointed Beelzebub to build stuff and show other people how to build stuff. If God has anointed you for something, dwell in that area of your expertise and your gifting and allow other people to learn from you. Your anointing is far different than mine. Each one of us has a responsibility to heal the brokenhearted or feed the hungry or clothe the naked. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every one of us is anointed to do that, but we are also anointed by the Spirit of God to be artistic and creative. Use what God has given you to His glory. Yes. And show other people how to do what you do so your generations will be passed down, your, your expertise will be passed down. It's an anointing of God. Yes. So I just wanted you to know that God... Look out in the world. What, what is it? Romans, Romans 1, right? Romans 1.20. Listen to this. I'll get there before you. If you do, go ahead. Too, bit, too late, though. I'm pretty fast. <laughs> Romans 1.20. It says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, or divine nature, so that we and they are without excuse. In other words, creation shows him. What did uh, Abraham Lincoln say? Uh, any man who can look up at the stars at night and say there is no God is a fool. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Anybody that can look at a caterpillar that has turned into a butterfly mm -hmm. yeah. and say there is no God is an idiot. <laughs> there is no other way there is no other way that stuff just doesn't happen it just doesn't happen mm. and so we see God's classroom is creation God's university is creation okay uh, so God fills us with the spirit he, he puts in us this wealth mindset we listen to this wealth, riches listen to this it's a national anointing right Wealth to a guy who's getting a job out of Polaris will look different to the guy who just invested a hundred million dollars into a factory to build those off road vehicles. Okay? And the same with Mother Teresa, she her wealth. Hallelujah. So anybody who is can have a wealthy mindset. That guy working at uh, Polaris, I don't know how much they're going to make, but I hope it's enough to do his family, but if it's a not, he needs to realize that that's the wealth that God has put in his life. And it's wealth to him. A guy who hasn't had a job in 10 years goes work at Polaris, make 18 bucks an hour. He figures he's a rich dude. Any guy that's been living under the bridge over here and finally gets a house back over here somewhere, he is rich. He feels rich. He's, he's wealthy at that point in time. Hallelujah. And the same with the guy that's investing that $100 million over there. It's okay. Now he feels wealthy because he's going to get a 20% kickback on that every year from now on. Praise the Lord. We need to realize that we are wealthy people. And we need to help people to understand that they are wealthy. Because we live in a country that still has possibilities. <clears throat> still has great possibilities. Not only for money, but for education. You know, almost everybody who's living on the street could get an education free. Free. You just put in for it, and they'll, they'll educate you to do something else. Because they don't want you living on the street, because they're paying for you to live on the street. 
It costs them more for you to live on the street and suck off of a welfare and all that other stuff than put you to work and let you work for your own. It's really true. So the government itself will send you to school for crying out loud. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, there's a, there's a mindset that says, what was that guy? Matt, the guy out of the ranch. Tell the story of that guy out of the ranch. It's ridiculous. It's just beyond me. Which one? The guy with the getting the garbage. Guy. Oh, that one of the guys, he was homeless in Reno, had been for years, and he was used to eating out of dumpsters. He goes out to the ranch, gets in the program, and everyone would notice he'd, pick, he'd see food in the garbage can and pick it up and eat it. People started giving him such a hard, you don't got to do that. We've got a house full of food. And it was. You don't have, and he ended up having to sneak it out of the garbage because he couldn't let it be there. He, if he saw food in the garbage, he had to take it and use it. That is a poverty mentality yes. so ingrained in a man that he cannot see he's going to have enough tomorrow. Or if he doesn't get that out of the garbage can, he's not going to have enough. Or somebody else isn't going to have enough. I used to have to eat the stuff in my plate because I knew those guys in Ethiopia were starving to death. And if they're starving to death and I wasn't eating my stuff, then I was disrespecting them. No, no, no. Send some money or some food over to Ethiopia. And if the stuff on your plate and you're full, throw it in the trash. <laughs> Why? Because it's just as good to waste it there as it is to waste it here. Because it's a waste either way. Yes. That's pe why people, most people are too big. Because they're wasted here rather than there. That's Marilyn Martin told me that. Right on. <laughs> Hallelujah. She's awesome. She said, I, I said, you just, you just threw all that food away. And she just looked me right in the eye. She, oh, better to waste it there than here. That's my girl. Yeah, she is great. I just love that girl. Okay. So, God's classroom. So I wrote down here, don't cut class. Don't cut class. Stop and smell the roses. Go and watch the moon. Hallelujah. Did you see it this morning? It's awesome. Praise the Lord. Do, do something. Go watch a butterfly do its thing. Go get an egg in your hand and watch it hatch. Whatever. I don't know. You see what I'm saying. Go eat a grape. <laughs> yeah, eat a grape. <laughs> it's like, don't peel it for It's like God is showing us this movie about his greatness and his artisticness and his uh, absolute uh, extravagant nature. Here's one for you. Did you know, and I know that you think there's societies out in space, the Bible says God put the moon in the sky to light the night, and he put the stars in the sky to light the night for the earth. There's a hundred, at least a hundred billion galaxies well, I think there's 350 billion galaxies with 350 billion stars apiece that goes on as far as anybody could see and God put all that in space and created the light between them and us. Because those ones out there, it'd take a million years for the light to get here for crying out loud. Okay, that's how far they are away. He created all that light and all those stars and all that moon <coughs> to light the earth at night. That is extravagant. And I watch Star Trek. Praise the Lord. So let's just stop there. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for being extravagant in your giving, for being so courageous in your creativityness, for making duckbill platypuses and <laughs> elephants and bugs. Lord, we are impressed with you every day. Yes. Help us not to forget where we came from, but help us, Lord, to remember where we're going. And help us, Lord, to function on this earth just exactly like you want us to. We love you, God. We want the world to know you're alive. We trust you, Lord, in these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As he is, so are we in the world. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to give today. Because, Lord, the, the fans are still going, the cooler is on, and we are cool. Yes. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll read a couple more. Cool, cool.
found this little book. Even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. That is great. Don't spend your life trying to make right decisions. Invest your life in making decisions and making them right. Yeah. I gotta get this one. I forget where it was. I got one. Go ahead. Today's eight eighteen. Look up Deuteronomy eight eighteen and take it to heart. Did you know that uh, Was George Washington took an oath? And right after he took the oath, all of him and all the Congress went over to the church and had service. When he was done taking his oath with his hand on the Bible, open to Deuteronomy 28, he the bent blessing. down and kissed the Bible, and then they went to service. Oh, George Washington was a Christian. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, yeah. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That good? Yes. You guys knew that one, didn't you? I had another one, this, this was a Caleb thing, this one of the ministers, he was talking about how so many people are looking for happiness and happiness, and I just want to be happy. And he said, the, the main thing they don't know, they think happiness is some kind of a Rock and roll, uh, what's the name of it? Some kind of high end experience. And they don't see their happiness as the peace that they have. Yeah, hallelujah. You know, we have peace when we're on the mountain, when we're in the valley, we have constant peace. Here's one about happy. I'm a kind of paranoid in reverse. I suspect people are blind to make me happy. <laughs> <laughs> That was pretty good. Yeah. There you go, man. So, Lord, bless these guys. Yes, go ahead. I just got a text from Joe. Don't you announce Wednesday night? Wednesday night. Oh, yeah, Wednesday night we're having a, a guy that plays the guitar and sings here. And we're having a. Uh, Sounds like you. Uh, yeah. Doesn't look like me, though. <laughs> and we're having a, um, a wedding over at uh, Steve and Dawn's place. Oh, yeah. At what time of day? At five o'clock. So myself, I'm gonna to go to Stephen Don's at five, do a wedding, and come over here at six. Praise the Lord. But come to both. It's gonna be really neat. This guy, Tony Patterson, uh, he's been here before one time. Stan Pullman is his name. Stan Pullman is his name. He sings and ministers. It's it's good. It's really good. And this, Don's place? I don't know. Huh? Where's Stephen Don's place? On Red Rock Road. Red Rock. Where's that? Um, off of the highway. Farm um, District. Oh, yeah. District, yeah. It's off of Farm District or off of... Yeah. Yeah. It's down by the golf course. If you go straight out the highway, there's a kind of a funky turn off onto a dirt road. That's Red Rock Road. Yeah. And right. it shows the fire truck. Wherever you see the fire truck sign. Yeah, that's right. That's where it is right. so yeah. That's where it is on Farm District. You turn on the fire truck sign. So come at 5 o'clock on Wednesday. It's going to be really fun. They're great. They know how to throw a party. Oh, yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah. Now, tonight, speaking of parties, what? I'm staying for the party. I'm staying for the party, yes. I'm coming over here. Virginia's staying for the party. She likes parties. This evening, over at uh, Matt and Regina's house, we're going to have another potluck. We're going to have it in the backyard instead of the front yard. Okay? So. Because that threw him one. <coughs> six what? Threw them last week when it was yeah, in the front Yeah, threw them last week. Yeah, it was in the front yard. It was really pretty out there. And we're going to see how pretty the backyard is, too. So uh, so bring bring, uh, bring food, bring an appetite, bring a guitar, bring whatever. Praise the Lord. So that's what we're doing. All right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Most importantly, bring God with you.